morning, Redemption Church. It's so good to see you guys. Um, it, it is the appropriate question to begin with. Um, uh, many of those faces you probably recognize from Priscilla Schreier and on, um, Eric Metaxas. And uh, who's your one, really, if, if you didn't already know, if you are new to Redemption Church in any way, it, it's kind of our, our 2020 vision. It's God has called each of you and each of us to be a part of how God is, has chosen to move. God is choosing to move and to uh, not only make disciples, but also to reach a lost world. And here's what's great about, about Jesus, is, is you have all the amount of Jesus, all, of the amount, uh, all the amount of his Holy Spirit in you that you need to open up our mouths and share how Christ has changed your life and pour that into the life of another and share the love of Christ. And, and, and then you know what? Here's, here's what's great. I'm gonna free you from the responsibility because Jesus refree, frees us from the responsibility. You're not responsible for saving that person. You're responsible for telling that person. And we get that opportunity to share uh, this incredible message that we talk about every single Sunday into the lives of people that are looking for hope, looking for something different, looking for something to hold on to. So, so be in prayer. Who's your one? Uh, who has God put in, in, in front of you uh, to kind of uh, pour your life into and share the love of Christ with? Um, there's a couple of different resources that I made mention last weekend, and I'll let you know. Um, we've got uh, kind of a prayer guide as you're walking through this. Who's your one? I encourage you to grab some of that. There's also... Uh, a kind of a three-circle tool. Maybe you're afraid of that conversation or maybe you don't feel prepared. The great thing about that three-circle conversation is you can literally have that book in front of you while you walk someone through. And then you can just walk them through that book and it'll help kind of unfold what Christ's message really is, the good news of the gospel really is. So I encourage you to grab a couple of those uh, before you go. If you guys have your Bibles, I want you to turn to the book of Romans as we continue on our Roman expedition. Um, this is, uh, we're finally ending chapter three, okay? All right. <laughs> it seems like we've been here for a little bit, um, for quite some time, but uh, this morning we're gonna finish up chapter three, and I love how Paul finishes, uh, finishes this particular chapter up. It's kind of, he kind of hits on a couple different things um, that, that sometimes hinder our ability to live the Christ life life that he's calling us into. How often sometimes our default is always to, uh, to be away from God rather than toward God, really understanding who Christ is, and, and we're so desperate to hold on to some of those things. Um, but let me kind of recap. Last weekend, and as well as the weekend before, and the weekend before that, it seems like one of the things that we were introduced is this idea of justification. In Romans chapter 3, verses 23 and 24, Romans 3, 23 is a very familiar one that all of us, most of us, maybe have been in church for any, any amount of time would recognize. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now, that's actually a present tense. Uh, that's, it's very present tense when you actually look at the language and the way the sentence is laid out, meaning we're constantly falling short. It's not like we fell short way back when. No, every single day we fall short of the glory of God. Okay, so, uh, so then he goes on to say, and this is where Jesus comes in, and he says, but now, remember last week, and but now we have been justified. That legal term where God says, but now God has declared you innocent. What a beautiful word, especially for those that know that they're guilty. When you hear that you're innocent, all of a sudden it's like, oh, wow, I wasn't expecting that. Oh, wow, my God actually declares me innocent. And here it is, it's not because of anything we've done. It's everything that he's done on our behalf for you. And it says he's justified by, uh, we are justified by his grace as a gift. Through, through what? The redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Because of what Jesus has done alone, alone, you and I have been invited into participating in eternity with God Almighty. We've been invited in to put our faith in the hope that what Jesus did on the cross in his death, his burial, and his resurrection was enough 
for me, was enough for you, was enough for any of us that really understand and take that step of faith that God, is ask, that God asks of us. Despite our sinful diagnosis, because we're all plagued with it, we've all sinned and fall short, Jesus still comes and he offers it to you and me. Now, again, I mentioned last week also that this really is, this is found by faith. And it's not just, uh, it's not just this head knowledge, it's this heart knowledge. Like if Jesus isn't, if Jesus doesn't come through, I have nothing. I mean, it's that kind of faith where, where I have faith that if, that if Jesus hasn't, I, I, I literally am throwing everything, all my eggs into this one basket, all, all my life, all my next breath, all my existence into who Jesus is. And if Jesus fails, and I assure you, he never does. If Jesus fails, then I have nothing. But if Jesus is who he said he is, if he did what he said he did, and accomplish the things that you and I could never accomplish, meaning handle our sin, find, find redemption for actual forgiveness, not just for a moment, but for eternity, for a lifetime, then it's enough. It's enough. And so we have this incredible gift we're invited into by putting our faith, our hope, and trust uh, in Jesus Christ alone. Now, this morning... This morning we find this, um, we find, we're, we're going to learn a little bit about what I like to call this balancing act. This balancing act, this, this game. And, and I don't want you to think it in the form of kind of a teeter-totter. I want you to think it in, in, more in the form of rock climbing. Any, 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 anyone that's gone like to rock climbing gym before? A couple, couple of us? Okay, all right. All right. I, I, I used to really be involved in that. I used to live close to one of those. And so I, I would try to get, at, I'd get it in and to the gym all the time and, and climb. And, and it was awesome. Man, I loved going up and, and finding new ways to get to the top and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and what's interesting is, is when you go to some of those, uh, most of those gyms, you have something at the very top. Um, uh, or it's usually anchored at the bottom, it's called an auto belayer, where you actually don't have to have a person belaying you up, meaning the safety rope is not actually found, uh, held by another person. It's actually held by this machine, and it's called the auto belayer. And when you connect to it, when you get all the way to the top, when you get all the way to the top, um, you actually have to let go. <laughs> now, I, I remember the very first time I remember the very first time that I was actually connected to an auto belayer. And some of you may be able to relate to this. I remember I, I, was, an un, I was uncertain from the very get-go, but I, I went ahead and I, I climbed all the way to the top, one, 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 one of this, these high, high walls, and, uh, and I got to the top, and, and what I kept doing is I kept kind of pulling on this thing, and I was like, this feels super loose. <laughs> this feels super, I don't know. This feels super, I, I don't know. And so, I, and so everyone's down there going, hey, let go. <laughs> just, just let, and I'm going, nope, nope. Mm -mm. It's easy for you. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, I, I just, I went, so I literally white knuckled the, the, the rock wall, and I'm like this. I can't, I can't do it. I can't, you know what I'm saying? And I'm, I'm literally just holding on with all that I have, and there's like, let go, let go. Finally, my strength, I, I couldn't actually hold on any longer. I, and so as much as I wanted to hold on, it literally was kind of a, ah, and I fell and literally my heart just dropped and I fell like maybe a foot, foot and a half, and then it caught. And I mean, I'm like, oh, thank you. I'm like kissing the rope. I was like, yes, this is great. This is awesome. I didn't really, okay, all right, all right. <laughs> But I, I was so thankful. I was like, oh my goodness. And, and I remember having conversations at the base going, what took you so long? <laughs> why, didn't you, why didn't you believe what we were saying? It's, it's because in that moment, it, I, I just felt like all I had was me. All I had was, was my grip my ability to hold on, to stay as close as I could, to, to grab on to all, all the things that I, I needed to, I just, I didn't feel like, I didn't feel like this was enough. 
I, feel, I felt like I needed to, to grab onto something. And, and it's interesting when we look at Paul and we look in Romans chapter 3, man, he, he, he identifies this at the end of chapter 3. It's really this balancing act. And, and it's between two poles, okay? Uh, there's a North Pole and South Pole, okay? There's between two poles. The, 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 the one pole is everything that Jesus has done for us. The endowment of his righteousness that we have been given because the, of the grace of God. That's, on, that's one pole. But then on the other pole is my desire to be in control. My desire to contribute to my own salvation. My desire to see things happen the way that I want rather than the way God wants. And so we go back and forth, back and forth. It's, it's 100% righteousness in, in Jesus, uh, but my control. And it's, it's, like this, it's this balancing act. And, and I love how sometimes, it, 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 sometimes we get to that place where God maybe brings in experience and all of a sudden it's like, oh, I can trust. And for a moment we find that, oh, yeah, this is the way it's supposed to be. But then all of a sudden we go back to this other, this other extreme of trying to, to find our own way. And all of a sudden our life, has your life ever felt like it's a little bit off? I mean, it reminds me of that V8 commercial. You know, you're kind of like a little, I don't know if you remember that. You just kind of, you wake up kind of at an angle. You're just, uh, I'm feeling a little bit off. And you know what? Sometimes I feel like that. Sometimes I feel like my life is just a little bit off. I'm, I, 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 and, and I don't know ultimately what it is. And Paul identifies, he's like, because your life is kind of out of whack. You're continuing to hold on to things that Christ has asked us to lay down. It's those things that end up becoming burdens. Those things that end up robbing you from what Jesus has ultimately done for you. And it goes back and forth. Chuck Swindoll said it this way. He said, balance is the place that I cross on my way to another extreme. So I find balance maybe for a moment, but it's just for a moment because all of a sudden I'm going back to my ways. I'm going back to my extreme of got to have my control. Martin Luther said this. He said, the history of theology is like a drunk man getting on his horse only to fall off the other side, only to repeat the process over and over and over. It's like I get, uh, yes, I'm on the horse. Oh, there we go, you know? And sometimes the Christian life, let's be honest, it, it feels like that. It feels like that. But here, can I encourage you? Um, you're not out of the norm. You're not out of the norm. That's Okay. We're, we're, God is, is teaching us. It, it's almost like Mr. Miyagi and karate. Learn balance. Learn balance. You know, the, the karate kid. Okay, I don't, maybe I'm dating myself. But the kids are like, I have no idea what you're talking about right now. Okay, it's a movie called The Karate Kid. All right, Ralph Macchio. <clears throat> yes, all right, you know. Um, okay, I can't stay there. Um, but really learning balance, I mean, it, it takes a lifetime. And here it is, it never stops. God is constantly, constantly taking things out of our life that unbalance us, that, that con to, in order to align ourselves. You know, the auto belay works best when we're fully aligned with it. Because when we're over here and it's pulling, because we think, oh no, and then we let go, guess what? You actually fall for a couple more feet before it catches. It's interesting, it works best when we're aligned. And so when we're aligned with where God is, man, that, that, that cord feels like the safest thing we could hold on to. Because it is. In fact, it's the only thing that we can. Even though we clamor and we try to hold on as best as we can, we think we know best. Well, Paul, in Romans chapter 3 and verse 27, which is where we're going to read here, he identifies, I think, three human tendencies that we constantly maybe run to that constantly throw us out of balance. So let's look at these, three, these four verses with me. If you don't have it, it's gonna be on the screen here. This is what Paul says. He says, then what becomes of our boasting? It's ex it is excluded. By what kind of law? By, by a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? 
Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. Father, would you give us wisdom? I pray, Holy Spirit, that you alone would deliver your truth to us, that it would plant inside of our hearts in the right way, that we would not fight against truth, but we would be willing to receive it, and that it would forever change us into being more like you. God, thank you so much that you're so patient with us, and you draw us into a deeper love relationship with you every single day. Lord, we love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. I think our first human tendency, and it happens a lot, and Paul kicks off this verse in verse 27. He says, uh, then what becomes of our boasting? I love the way the NLT says it. He goes, can we boast then that we have done anything to be accepted by God? Can we boast about anything? Because sometimes at the end of the day, we're unwilling to let go of our ego. We're, we're unwilling sometimes to let go of our pride. Sometimes these, these the, we, we have seen ourselves, we, we maybe know what we're capable of, and we're still trying to grab onto these rocks and crevices on our own, thinking that it's not just Jesus, it's Jesus plus something. It's Jesus and something. Because Jesus clearly can't be enough. He can't be that, that audible, no, no, I, I've got to assist. I've got to help out. And we're constantly fighting with white knuckling things in our life, thinking that, that it's okay. I've got to be able to contribute in some way. You know, in the Middle, in the middle Ages, um, pride was consider, considered one of the seven deadly sins, right? It was considered one, but today, if you think about pride and, and you look at our, our, our media and our world, it, it's almost seen kind of as a virtue, right? It, it's almost like, uh, oh my goodness, did you see this person or that person? And, and it's almost like it's, it's welcomed, it's encouraged. Yeah, you should be able to, to exalt yourself and, and talk about all of your accomplishments and everything that you did. It's the loudest voice and man, our world almost praises it. And Paul's going, I, I mean, really? Do you, do you have anything to boast about when it comes to salvation? I mean, do you have anything that you really bring, that you bring to the table when it comes to you being justified, you being forgiven, you being offered 100% of my son's righteousness? Do you really bring something to, is there anything? Is there anything that actually uh, is brought to the table by you, by me. C.S. Lewis, when he talked about pride, is he says, you know, pride's an interesting thing. It's actually competitive by nature, okay? Because see, if you and I were all rich in here, none of us would have pride about anything, right? We wouldn't, because we'd all, all be rich. It's not enough for all of us to be rich. It's for me to be richer than you. You see how that works? It's, it's always competitive. It's I, I have pride because I'm better. I, I bring something to the table. This is what C.S. Lewis said. He goes, pride gets no pleasure out of having something, only out of having more. There it is, more of it than the next man. We say that people are proud of being rich or clever or good looking, but they're, they really aren't. They are proud of being richer or cleverer or better looking than others. If everyone else became equally rich or clever or good looking, there would be nothing to be proud about. It is the comparison that makes you proud, the pleasure of being above the rest. Paul is addressing the church in Rome here in verse 27, and he's attacking really kind of that pride of religion. Like you guys think you contribute. I, 
you guys think you bring something to the table. You, you guys think that somehow, some way, all these, these laurels and capabilities have offered something. I was laughing because I, I, I had this thought, and I, I, I enjoy watching Superman movies. I like, I like watching the old ones, the newer ones. It doesn't matter. Um, I like watching Superman. But imagine for a moment if... Um, if Superman all of a sudden save, saves me um, as I'm, I'm jumping off, I, I'm literally falling off a building, I, whatever, and I'm falling off the building and then he grabs me and, and then he brings me to the ground and he sets me down. Now, think about this. Imagine if I turned to him and, and I looked at him and I said, thanks Superman, I, I, I appreciate that, but uh, I helped you in saving me. And he's going, What? Yeah, listen, I, have you seen my 401k? Okay, all right, I know that, I know that helped you. I know that it really helped you. No, as a matter of fact, you know what? I, I've got some incredible relationships going on in my life right now. That kind of helped with the whole saving bit. I, I, I got it. I mean, I, I, I mean, I basically kind of saved myself, but we'll give you some credit kind of thing, you know? I, I mean, understand this, this that, that's ridiculous when you think about it. But do we really do anything different when it comes to Jesus? I mean, Jesus goes, I, I saved you. I did for you what you could not do, to your, do for yourself. And yet we still come going, God, I, I bring something to the table. I'm a pretty good person. I'm a pretty great guy. I'm a pretty great gal. I, I, I bring some things to the table. The bottom line is, is you do not come to God with your good resume but with your sin resume. That's, it's, it's not coming to God saying, God, look at what I did. No, it's coming to God saying, look what I could never do. See, that's the difference. Jesus, look what I could never do. And he goes, that, that's, that's what I need. See, it's, it's like, a jo it's like, it's like going, going for a job. It's, it, it's, it's not saying, hey, look at what I did this, I did this, I did this. You know what? You wouldn't get hired for the job. It's coming to Jesus, asking for a job. In this sense, if I came to Jesus, I mean, it's the weirdest kind of job resume. It's coming to Jesus going, okay, um, uh, I'm, I'm going to turn from you. Um, I'm probably going to fall short in every aspect of this job. Um, I'm, I'm broken. Um, I, I've got some addictions that are going on. And, uh, and I'm always going to fall short. And God goes, hired, done. See, that just doesn't make sense to us. But that's at the end of the day. That's the way we need to come to, to Christ is saying, I, I bring nothing but my brokenness. And all that, that's, that's my resume. And that's what Jesus accepts. That's what Jesus wants from us. It's not, we have nothing to boast in. It's excluded. And here's what's interesting. He goes, um, when boasting is in your life, boasting and faith are at odds with each other. They're incompatible. They, they, they don't fit. And that's why Paul introduces both into this verse. Paul's saying that true faith and uh, true faith in Christ and boasting, they don't marry with each other. And so if you have an ego in your life, you have pride in your life, and you're, you're somehow uh, saying, I've got it, I got it. You're the I got it guy, or I got it, I, I got it, 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 I got it. I'm the I got it person, okay? You're constantly, and you may not say that, but we live like that. God, I got it, 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 I got it. But God goes, no, you, you don't got it. And so if we have this in our life, it's one of two things. Either you've actually never you've never truly understood salvation. Because if you're still thinking that I contribute or I bring something, maybe you really don't know the Lord. Because if you saw your sin appropriately and how desperate you really are and how broken you really are, only then can we see Jesus appropriately and how desperate we need to be for him and what he's brought alone to us. We don't bring anything to the table. All we got is Jesus. It's not Jesus and, it's just Jesus. It's just Jesus. It's always been just Jesus. There is one kind of person. It's the lost person. And there's only one kind of savior. And his name is, and his name is Jesus. It takes coming to this place of absolute humility, seeing ourselves for who we are, what we don't have, 
the accomplishments that actually, it, it doesn't matter. If you were here a couple weeks ago, I shared the story about the swimmers. All three of the swimmers that were trying to get from Hawaii to Japan swimming, they all died, even though they died at different places. One was a bit better swimmer. It didn't matter. They all still died. Do you see that? They still didn't make it. We all fall short of God's glory. No matter how great you think you are, we all fall short of God's glory. And it takes a savior that lies outside of us to offer us his righteousness. So we gotta let go of our ego because that's gonna always keep us off balance. I think the second human tendency is this idea to be exclusive. And so he, he comes into this in verse 29. Look at this. He says, or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles also? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since God is one, who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith? Now remember, Paul is pinning this letter to the Roman, to the church in Rome, okay? So there's this church in Rome and initially the church of Rome was made up of Jews and Gentiles. Well, history tells us that Emperor Claudius, about five years previous, decided to oust the Jews. So he wanted all the Jews out of Rome. So guess what? All that left there in Rome were the Gentile, some of the Gentile believers. And they, they were still the church because the church isn't a building, it's the people. So the Gentiles were faithfully serving the Lord as best as they could. Well, then at the end of that five years, you know what? The Jews were allowed to come back in. And so the Jews started coming back. And you know what? The Jews had certain practices of cleanliness and different things like that that they always lived by. Well, the Gentiles hadn't been around the, the Jews for about five years, and they loved pork. Give me some bacon. I'm a Gentile. Got to have some bacon. It's all right. Okay. Because what, what God has called clean, it's clean. I can have some bacon. Give me some gravy, all that kind of stuff. Need it, all right? I mean, they were, they were some sweet Alabamians, you know what I'm saying? I loved it. It was great. They, 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 they wanted to, 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 to live in the freedom that Jesus had offered. Well, well all of a sudden, guess what happened? Uh, there were some lines drawn in the sand. Uh, you don't... You don't you're, you're a little bit different than me. You're, we're, we're seeing things different. And, and so all of a sudden the Gentiles look down on the Jews, but then the Jews who were super religious and they abided by all these, they were looking down on the, the, the Christian Gentiles. And, and so all of a sudden these lines were drawn in the sand rather than going, there's not, uh, there's not any kind of different kind of race. And this is what happens. We think we're part of this elite club when it comes to Christianity. I don't know we talked about this a couple weeks ago, but, but we're really not part of an elite club. We, we, we really aren't. And when we begin to see people, um, when we begin to see people uh, in, that, in that light, thinking that somehow I've got something that they don't, and we begin to kind of hold on to that like a, as if it's, it's like a plus in our category, which makes everyone else a minus, then we begin to draw lines in the sand to, to, to determine who's worthy of this message of the gospel. All of a sudden, we determine, we, became, we become judge, jury, and executioner, right? I determine whether or not, now, and I love this who's your one scenario. We're all praying for who's our one. But can I just say that if you're not seeing people the way that Jesus does, then you may never find your one. You know why? Because all of a sudden, uh, hey, we want to be obedient to God. We want to be obedient to Jesus. Yes, I want to tell people about the good news of Jesus, but not that kind of person. But, and I'll, t I'll go wherever you want me to go, but I'm not going to go on that side of town. They're, di they're different. Oh, y you know what? And here's a big one in, in, our, in the South, okay? And, it, and it's, it's absolutely abhorrent, and it defies everything. This idea that just because someone is a different color, they're less than us. We gotta move past that, people. You know why? Because there's no, there's, there's no races. There's one race, and it's called the human race. Jesus died for all. And, and you know what? And, and, and if you start kind of, kind of separating yourselves because of even political differences, I know, I know, or even uh, Alabama, you know, we got Auburn and Alabama. You know, I mean, whatever, we, we divide ourselves about who's less than, who's worthy. If we start doing that with people, 
We're never going to see people the way that Jesus does. We're all, all, Jesus died for all. He made his grace available to all. And everyone that believes, everyone that believes in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ will be saved. That means, that means uh, black, white, Asian, Latino. It doesn't matter. It, it means uh, Republican, Democrat. It doesn't matter. You, you, do you see what I'm saying? Jesus, stop thinking there's, there's a, this exclusivity. We're in some sort of club. Now, I will say this. I will say this. There is an exclusivity when it does come to Christianity. And this is what I mean when I say that. I mean, there is an exclusive way that God has invited us in to know him. Our world would love, love to teach that all roads lead to heaven. Like Jesus, God is so loving. He'll never condemn me. No, no, he loves me too much. I, I know I can live outside my means and do some things, but, but he loves me too much and, and, and he'll, he won't send me to hell. He won't send me to hell. And the reality is, as Jesus did say in John 14, 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. So Jesus is very clear. There is an exclusivity in how, what salvation is and how it is known and found. There is one God and there is one way to him. But here's what's incredible about Christianity that differs from all other religions, all other things. Our exclusivity is much different than all these other things because he actually makes it available to everybody. So it's exclusive in regard to how we get to Jesus, but it is all inclusive in who's allowed in. Tim Keller said this, he said, all religions are by nature exclusive because religion is man's, man's attempt at understanding God and understanding how to get to God. So there is an exclusive nature to it. But Christianity though, is the most inclusive exclusivity there is. I love that. So yes, God is made one way through his son in which we can be redeemed and saved by his grace alone. But there's not any kind of person on the planet who ever has lived, living or ever will live that he doesn't invite. And they're all valuable. They're all worthy to be loved. They're all worthy to be cared for. They're all worthy uh, to, to, uh, to, to literally see with the eyes of Jesus. And you know what? One of the things that I think sometimes we miss, um, and, I, and I had a, a really rough confrontation one time, and it wasn't really a confrontation, but it was a lesson for me. If I'm not, I, I'm missing something when I don't love the whole person. And let me explain what I mean. I, I used to take a, a student home um, that played baseball, and um, he, uh, his mom couldn't drive, and so in order to be a witness to this, to this kid, um, I would drive him to and from his house during baseball season, and, and every day, I mean, I was constantly giving him the gospel. I was like, man, let, us, let me tell you about Jesus. Let me do this. Hey, Jesus died for you, and I was constantly giving to him because I took that opportunity to and from baseball practice in order to do that. And I remember at the end of one time, I, I asked him, I said, man, do you want to give your heart to Christ? And he looks at me in, in all honesty, and, and it changed my pers perspective about a lot of things. He goes, he goes, Joel, can I just say something to you? You don't care about me. You just care about my soul. And then he closed the door and he walked away. I just thought about that. And I was like, am I seeing and viewing this kid as a project? Am I seeing or viewing this kid um, just as, as a means to, and then once that box is checked, like I, I just write them off? Or trying to tally up numbers or whatever, you know, got that one, got that one? Or do I really love that boy? Because that's my first, I need to love that boy. You know Why? Because that might be the greatest message of the gospel being shown to that kid more than my words. And then, maybe just then, 
when he knows, when she knows that I love them, maybe that's the means by which the wall comes breaking down and the gospel becomes real to them. So that when the gospel is shared, all of a sudden, that's exactly what I need. Because I've seen it in his life and in her life every single day. How can I not long for what Jesus has offered? I need that. We gotta love people. We gotta stop this exclusivity. And it throws us off balance our whole life when we do that. The Talmud, which is kind of the, the Jewish writings, is written in there. It actually says each morning a Hebrew man would pray. And you know what they would pray? They would pray, thank God I'm not a woman. I'm just telling you. Thank God I'm not a woman or a slave or a Gentile. Here's God's sense of humor. You ready? There was a Jewish rabbi by the name of Paul who rolls in to Philippi. And you know the first three converts? A woman, a slave, and a Gentile. Because God goes, I love them all. It's almost like, it's like God going, challenge accepted, bring it. Challenge, bring it. I'm gonna save every, you don't think that person can be saved? Okay, all right, we'll see. That person, yeah, yeah, I specialize in those people. It doesn't matter. He specializes in all people because he wants all to know him. And he makes all available to know the Lord. Paul in Philippians, and I'll end with this point here for a second and then we'll, we'll, fi we'll finish up. Paul in Philippians chapter three. If, Paul, if anyone had anyone to bra anything to brag about, exclusivity or pride or anything like that, it was Paul. He had everything going for him. He had massive influence politically, religiously. The guy was a Pharisee. He was brilliant. He was a philosopher, a theologian. He could literally, he could uh, rattle off Old Testament like it was second language. I mean, he just, he just had everything going for him. If anyone had anything to brag about, it would be Paul in the Old Testament. And when Paul, Paul literally starts kind of listing all these things, he goes, if anyone has anything to talk about, it's me. But you know what I count it as? And this is what he says. He counts it as scubala. Say scubala. Scubala actually means poop. The slang version. Okay? I led you guys astray, I know. All right. He counts it as dung, as poop. It, it means nothing. It's trash. All my accomplishments, all my works, all my capabilities, all these things are meaningless when it comes to Jesus. Jesus alone. It's not Jesus and, it's Jesus alone. He stands above all things. He's what I need. He's my need. He needs to be my first thought, my middle of the day thought, and my last thought, because Jesus is all I have. He becomes the, the belay that I hold on to with both hands going, thank you, kissing him, kissing his feet, praising his name. Because when I know what I'm saved from, it drives me to my knees to go, I'm not worthy of what you have offered me. I'm not worthy of what you have given me. All good people and all bad people need a savior. The third and final human, human tendency is this. Sometimes we go to extremes with this grace. So yes, we, ego some, and pride gets in the way. And all three of these really have a lot of pride. Uh, but then we also have this exclusivity sometimes that we incorporate. But f this final is sometimes we go to extremes of what Jesus has offered us um, almost to kind of wash away and discount the law altogether. Look at verse 29 or 31 with me. It says this, do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, on the contrary, we uphold the law. See, the final human tendency, I believe, is one of the most pervasive in our Christian culture. This is one of the, probably the most pervasive. It says, it says that Jesus has saved me. The law no longer matters. It's almost dissolved. I can live however I want because his grace is sufficient and I'm forgiven. Can I just say, that is a wicked, wicked heart and a wicked attitude 
to think like that. I mean, it, it, it genuinely is because, uh, because you're not seeing your sin appropriately. And you're definitely not seeing Jesus for what he has done in your life. Because when we see our sin, we realize we don't bring anything to the table. And then we see Jesus who owes us nothing, giving us everything. Then everything in my life wants to please him alone. Please him alone. This, this thought is almost kind of, it's called hyper grace. It's kind of the language. It's like this hyper grace. Like I can live in this world. I can go to the extremes of, of the freedom that God has offered me. Live however I want, whenever I want. It's just sinful, wicked thinking, guys. It, 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 it really, you, you misunderstand his grace. You misunderstand his forgiveness. You don't understand your sin. You don't see Jesus for who he is. If we truly understand justification by faith, if we truly understood it, then, uh, then know that it, it actually upholds the law. It doesn't erase it. The law does two primary things. And let me tell you, this, these are the two primary things that the law does for you and me, okay? The law doesn't disappear. Christ said, I have come not to not destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. And what, this is what the law does for us. The law reveals the character of God. It really does. When I look at the law, here it is. When I look at the law, and I'm dropping stuff, that's all right. When I look at the law, I, I see my Savior. I see God all laced through it. God's going, this is, my, this is how I want, this is my definition of holiness. This is what it means to live holy, above reproach. This is the life that not just I want, this is the life I demand. I demand. And before Christ, in our own sinfulness, we had zero ability to accomplish the law on any level. On any level. We were unable to do it. So the law reveals God's character to us, his standard. And it also, you know what it also does? When I see God's standard, it shows me my sin. It's constantly showing me my sin. Oh, yeah, I can't live up to that. <laughs> oh, yeah, I can't live up to that. But that's what it's supposed to do. But the second thing the law does is it actually functions as a guide to what God expects from us. That's really important. That's the part that we miss. That's the part of these, these hyper grace people. When you start kind of going, I can do whatever I want. It, it's not so much a question of, um, can I? I think the better question is, is, should I? Because if I walk down this path, guess what? The ramifications of sin, the consequences of sin are still the same. Meaning if I walk down a sinful life, even though by the grace of God I have been saved, sin will still lead me to death. Do you understand that? Like that pattern of sin is, is, will continue to rob me, steal from me, destroy me, take things from me. Things that, that God says, no, I want you to have in your life. But if we're constantly living, I can live however I want, all this kind of stuff. He's going to forgive me. All that, then you're not seeing Jesus. You're missing it. There is a holy life that God is calling us into. He's what's called is sanctifying us, making us more like him. See, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we are brought to faith in Jesus Christ, who enables us and calls our lives into union with God's law to make us more like him. It's kind of like this. It's kind of like the law are, is the railroad tracks, the railroad tracks to, to being holy, but then the gospel is the locomotive by which it pushes us there. Uh, see, we can't, we can't do it on our own, but with Christ, with him alone, I can begin to become more like him every day. I can, I can long for him more and less of my sin every single day because of who Christ is in my life. He's constantly giving us more freedom. He's constantly, but not free to sin, free to be more like him because that's true living. Life is in Jesus, not in, not in our wants, 
but then what he needs for us, the holiness, the life that he goes, if you do this, I promise you, I promise you life will look different. And even when tragedy comes, you can still look, look to Jesus. You can still, and be unshaken, be unmoved because all of life is about him and him alone. Jen Wilkins said this. She said, the law drives us to grace. That's what the law does. I see my sin. Oh, I need Jesus. Okay, we're all clear on that. But then grace, when truly understood, it actually drives us back to the law. So how am I supposed to live, God? Oh, this way? Da, da, right down the line? Yeah, I want to live like that. You know why? Because my obedience is a demonstration of my love to you. And I want to love you. I want to love you with my whole heart, my whole life. This is, this is our God. The law ultimately is good. It's not washed away. And Christ fulfilled it. And now through it, I see how I can live and truly live in holiness and live in his presence. Without the law, how could we ever, ever find conviction of sin? And so the law stands there in front of us knowing, oh yeah, I'm a little out of whack. Oh yeah, I just, I just walked away from Jesus a little bit. And then in love, God beckons us back and we find balance once again because of what Jesus alone has done. There's nothing to boast in nothing to boast in, nothing exclusive. There, there really isn't. And I'm not going to abuse God's grace by walking into this extreme of freedom and hyper grace and sin, because in, in doing so, I completely dismiss the law and the life Jesus is calling me into. Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24 says this, and we'll be done. He says, this is what the Lord says. See, we, we started out here with this boasting, thinking that we bring something to the table. And Jesus goes, hey, you, let, me, let me help you. This is what, if you want to boast about something, this is what you can boast in. Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts, boast in this, that they truly know me and understand that I am the Lord who demonstrates unfailing love, who brings justice and righteousness to the earth, and that I delight in these things. I, the Lord, have spoken. We boast that we have Jesus, that we know Jesus, that we're changed by Jesus, and we're forever living like Jesus. So my question is, is do you have Jesus? Because that's where it starts. That's where it begins. This morning, I pray that if you've never come into faith in Jesus Christ, the great thing about justification is it doesn't matter if you're saved for 20 years or if you're saved for 20 seconds. We're both justified equally because of the cross of Jesus Christ and what he did for us. And he freely offers it to you and to me for all who believe. Any walks of life, it doesn't matter the sin you once were part of. Currently walking in, God goes, let me bring you to a different place in your life and show you a life everlasting. Because if you let me have your life and you let me consume your life and you are consumed by me, I promise to show you life because I've given you life and I've given it to you everlasting. Do you know me? Let's go to the Lord in prayer.